Hi everyone, this is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes, and today I'm going to be talking about blue-white in Streets of New Capenna. I'm starting with blue-white because it is the most successful early color combination, um, and also the color combination that I've played the most. I did want to get in on those early wins before everyone is forcing this archetype. Before I get into it, I do want to remind everyone, notes for this episode, as usual, are available at patreon.com slash drafting archetypes. If you want to follow along with the research that I've done in advance and the notes that I've taken to use as a reference while I'm talking through things, like these percentages and such. So anyway, as I was saying, it currently on 17 lands wins 61.5% of its matches, more than any other two-color pair or three-color family. Uh, 61.5 is a very high win rate for a color combination. Notably, two-color pairs win 58% of the time overall, while three-color families win 55.9% of the time overall. That is a data point in favor of playing two colors over three colors. However, I would suggest that uh, this should be taken with some grain of salt because, in general, you're more likely to add a color to your deck if other people at the table are competing for the colors that you started in and your deck is going to be stronger if people aren't competing. Uh, we see in general across the board uh, that fewer colors, um, decks with fewer colors generally win more, not just because they have better mana, but also because it indicates something about what's happening uh, at your seat in the draft when that's able to happen. I would take it as clear evidence that it's reasonable to draft two colors, slight evidence that it might be better to draft two colors, but not confirmation that you should exclusively draft two colors in this format. I think blue-white has a very consistent game plan. There aren't like a lot of different ways to fundamentally approach what you're doing with a blue-white deck. I think that blue-white in this format is very tempo-oriented, uh, aggressive, uses evasive creatures well, and generally is trying to end the game. I think that this format in general skews substantially aggressive. Um, Blitz as a mechanic, even though that mechanic doesn't exist in blue-white, generally pushes the format that way. People are worse at blocking, better at attacking, because that's the nature of Blitz. Also, there are other pressures, um, good evasive creatures, things like Civil Servant, the green-white 2-3 that you can tap a citizen when it attacks to give it lifelink as like a defining common. Uh, that's a creature that attacks well. It has an ability when you attack that tells you that it attacks well. Similarly, Jetmir's Fixer, the red-green, two mana common. You can spend a red and a green to give it plus one, plus one until end of turn. If you spend a treasure, it gets a counter. When you have an activated ability that uh, can grow your creature, you are more likely to have untapped mana on your turn than your opponent's turn because you can attack before playing spells on your turn. So that creature can attack as like a virtual 3-3, discouraging your opponents from blocking so they take extra damage. And then you play a spell and you never actually had to commit that mana. It's the threat of activation creates a pseudo evasion ability. The same thing happens with the red-black body dropper that both has threat of activation and also the ability to get menace, aggressive abilities. So we see just across the board, um, and I mean also the blue-white uh, common, when it enters the battlefield, it taps a creature. If there's a counter, it locks the creature down. But just tapping a creature on your turn is exclusively an aggressive ability. So we see a lot of these like signpost commons that make this a good format for attacking. And when there are so many cards that are good at attacking, blocking's hard, the format becomes very proactive. The result is most decks want to be proactive, blocking's hard, attacking's easy. The format comes down to races a lot. And as it happens, I believe that the blue and white cards are kind of naturally best suited to play that game. And so we see blue-white with a very high win rate early. I tweeted a while ago that I thought that the design of this set was really brilliant in terms of how the different abilities in the different color pairs and families 
interacted in interesting ways. Uh, but that in terms of like whether that means that this is like an all-time great limited format or whatever is going to come down to the development, how balanced things are, uh, how many of the cards you want to play, how uh, what what the gameplay patterns are like. And early on, this appears to be a particularly skewed limited format where certain strategies and color combinations have a substantial structural advantage over other color combinations and strategies in a way that I personally would consider and think is often considered to be a detriment or mark against the format. It's more interesting for me when I have uh, when I have to draft a wider variety of decks and can explore more different strategies and play patterns across my drafts. Whereas in this format, I feel quite pressured to uh, essentially draft the same deck or slight variations on that deck over and over. There are some people who enjoy that, especially if they feel like they have a significant edge because the deck that they know to draft wins a lot. You know, not not trying to say objectively this is you know good or bad or whatever. Just these are concerns that I personally have about the format at the moment. There's obviously always a chance that it could correct somewhat. I think that, for example, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms had a similar issue where red and black were structurally very advantaged. And ultimately, it took a few weeks, but I did start to feel like everyone understood that red and black were so much where you should uh, start your draft as default that the color combination was overdrafted, which gave a little bit of breathing room to other archetypes. But I suppose I'm looking forward to the point in Streets of New Capenna's uh, arena draft metagame where it's harder to get blue-white and uh, there's a real incentive to branch out into other families. So part of why I chose to do this episode on blue-white is I think that Right now, it's most valuable for my listeners to know that they should be drafting blue-white while they can. And also, I think that it'll make the format more fun for everyone if everyone's trying to draft blue-white enough that uh, you can actually get some advantage by not drafting blue-white. Anyway, given that, or if it is true that blue-white plays in a very consistent way, or at least that a vast majority of players who draft blue-white are drafting toward the same game plan. Anytime that's true, the data that we have in 17 lands about how successful cards are is more valuable. Uh, If I'm playing a very different game plan than other blue-white drafters, the cards that succeed for me will be different than the cards that succeed for other blue-white drafters. If we're all playing the same game plan, then the cards should perform relatively similarly for all of us. So because I think that blue-white's nice and straightforward, it means that you can just look up the stats on 17 lands, see the cards that are rated most highly, and take them most aggressively, and end up with a pretty good deck. You'll want to make some adjustments for curve, but especially because you're trying to be very aggressive, this is also one where I have not done this, unfortunately, uh, where you might want to focus on opening hand win rate rather than or in addition to game and hand win rate because the nature of any aggressive deck is to reward having a good start, a good early game, which opening hand win rate as a stat is very good at telling you about. Anyway, there are some formats and archetypes where I think you should take the stats as a very loose guideline. This is one where I think you can take them as a tighter guideline. So with that in mind, I thought that it was worth specifically mentioning for people who aren't inclined to go look up the stats themselves or don't know how to do it or whatever, uh, which cards are really the standouts on 17 lands right now. And so the commons and uncommons that are winning more than 63% of the time, uh, so really the top tier commons and uncommons, in order, uh, winning most to least without getting into the exact number, just the the beginning of this list is better than the end of this list. All of them are very, very good. Psychic Pickpocket is the five mana, three, two, connive and bounce. Inspiring Overseer 
the 2-1 Flying Common that gains life and draws a card and enters the battlefield, Exotic Pets, the blue-white one instant that makes two fish, and then if you have a, any counters that you have, you can put copies of those counters on a fish, one, one counter per type of counter. You're usually trying to get a plus one, plus one counter, sometimes a shield counter. I think you need exactly Elspeth to get more than that. Fairy Vandal, the reprint from Eldrain, one, two, flash flyer that gets a plus one, plus one counter when you draw your second card in a turn. Sleep with the fishes, uh, two blue, blue aura enchant creature, taps the creature, it doesn't untap. When it enters the battlefield, you make a fish. Rufine's informant. 2-1 Connive for one and a white. Illuminator Virtuoso, 1-1 one, one Double Strike when you target it, Connive, when you target it with a spell. A Citizen's Crowbar, equipment that gives a creature plus one, plus one, and you can spend a white, tap it, and sack the crowbar to kill an artifact, to destroy an artifact or enchantment, and it makes a 1-1 one, one Citizen when you play it and attaches to that Citizen. And Mage's Attendant, the three mana, three, two, that makes a wizard that you can spend a mana to force spike a spell, a non-creature spell. Those are the top performing commons and uncommons, things that you should be generally looking for first in any packs, uh, including in all of your blue-white decks. All of those cards have stats that are high enough that you should just play them without question, uh, prioritize them over most other cards. The remaining cards that win more than the average amount for blue-white, so these are just above average cards, the other like noteworthy cards for the archetype, a list of similar length. Wing Shield Agent, the 2-3 uncommon with shield counter that when it attacks you can give another creature flying until end of turn. Out of the way, the one blue three colorless instant that bounces uh, on your opponent's non-land permanence and they draw a card and it costs two less mana if it's targeting something blue. Knockout Blow, deal four damage to an attacker or blocker, gain two life, costs uh, one mana instead of three if it's targeting something red. Slip out the back, phase out a creature, put a plus one plus one counter on it, make disappear, one in a blue instant uh, counter spell unless they pay two, casualty one. Celestial Regulator, one white blue two three flyer etb tap something it doesn't even tap if you have a plus one plus one counter on or if you have a counter on something echo inspector that's the two three flyer for blue three uh etb connives backup agent the plus, the one one that puts a plus one plus one counter on something for one in a white and majestic metamorphosis personal favorite of mine two in a blue instant creature artifact becomes a four four flying artifact creature until end of turn so Little info dump there. You're, if you don't remember all that, very easy to look it up. 17lands.com. Look for blue white, sort by game and hand win rate. You can see that list, including rares, but I did want to make sure to mention all those. There are some people who don't like the straight, here's some data that exists in the world without any analysis. But for this color pair, given what I said about how consistent it is, I think that it's just important things to know. Now for a little of my own commentary, there are a few cards that didn't make that list that I personally like disproportionately to their win rate. So for a little bit of my own take, now I'm not necessarily saying that these cards are better than those cards. Again, I think that there's a lot of reason in this set for this archetype, given its situation, to trust the data, but I personally I'm a fan of Expendable Lackey, the blue 1-1 one, one that you can spend one in a blue and exile it from your graveyard to make a fish. Rooftop Nuisance, two in a blue sorcery, casualty one, tap a creature, doesn't untap, draw a card. Skycrier, one in a white, one one flyer, three in a white, both players draw a card. And a little chat, uh, one in a blue, casualty one, look at the top two cards, put one in your hand, put the other on the bottom. A note on a little chat, it does not have good win rates. I might be heavily biased on this one based on having played it to very good success in Grixis and or Maestris and just uh, loving the card. I think it's very fun to play. I really like uh, how versatile it is in terms of being able to use it early if you need it to like dig for a land drop. And it's very satisfying to... Uh, like if your opponent's going to kill a creature, get to like look at four cards and draw two of them for two mana. I think that I like 
a little chat disproportionately to how good it is. Expendable Aki Rooftop Nuisance and Skycrier. I don't think that's what's going on. I think that the more you are truly doing the thing that I think that Blue White wants to do, which is really lean into just being very, very fast, very aggressive, prioritizing evasion and tempo spells, I think those cards in particular play extremely well with that plan. I think that you should be very heavily prioritizing backup agent in particular to put counters on your sky criers and your fish. And this this package of expendable Aki rooftop nuisance sky crier in particular, prioritizing all three of those together makes a lot of sense because well, primarily Expendable Aki and Rooftop Nuisance are really, really good together because Rooftop Nuisance is an awesome card if you have a good thing to casualty away. Expendable Aki is probably the best thing to casualty away. And then these little evasive creatures are stronger if you have the really powerful tempo swing offered by Rooftop Nuisance. So I do think that it's consistent to value these cards. So I think that my saying, I like these disproportionately to their stats is a coherent position. Like I said, it makes most sense to disagree with stats if you're doing something structurally differently than other people are. And while I think that most people are generally aggressive with their blue-white decks, I'm trying to be that, but just leveled up that little bit more. And I think that those cards really help in that that plan. Similarly, I think that I basically the bottom two cards in the above 61.5% win rate that I mentioned, Backup Agent and Majestic Metamorphosis, I value those two very highly and play them a lot. And I think that other people value them not as highly and play them not as much. And both of them are clearly amazing with Skycrier and also to a lesser extent, great with Expendable Lackey. And I think that that whole package of prioritizing Backup Agent Majestic Metamorphosis, Expendable Aki, Rooftop Nuisance, and Sky Cryer uh, is very, very strong. I, I would be happy to have a deck that was literally only those cards. Anyway, th those are the commons and uncommons of note generally. I do want to talk about cards that um, I think people are valuing incorrectly right now. And this, again, is largely based on uh, looking at their stats. It's hard for me to just like know what the average player is thinking or doing outside of by looking at the stats that tell me that because I, I can't get in the average player's head. So cards that stood out to me when looking at various sorts and looking for uh, blips in the data. So I tried some I tried something that I haven't done before, which is rather than so normally when I look for outliers, I look what are the most played cards? And then among those cards that people play the most in the archetype, which ones don't win as much as they should? And then I look for what are the least played cards, uh, the least played commons, and which of those win more than the cards around them. This time, rather than looking at overplayed and underplayed, I wanted to look at overdrafted. So I looked at the cards uh, that people are taking highest and looked for which of those things that people are drafting as really high picks and looked for which of them don't win as much as the others around them. Now, when you look for cards that are really high picks, you notice that first you're looking at a list of rare and mythic cards. People are very inclined to take rares for good reason. Uh, they add to your collection. They're often very strong. You don't get to play with them a lot. So rares that are only mediocre um, show up on this list a lot. So one that stood out to me was um, depopulate. Uh, I think this is a very strong card. This is uh, the essentially the Wrath of God in the set. Two white, white. Um, each player with a gold creature draws a card and then destroy all creatures. And it plays very well with shield counters because it just removes the shield counter rather than killing the creature. White is a color that has shield counters. So it would make sense that uh, it would be a particularly good format for a wrath because you can do this thing where your creatures at least some of them naturally live through it your opponents don't despite that it had a really bad uh win rate but notably it had a pretty good improvement when drawn so when players drafted it they did better when they drew it and then when they didn't 
but they did very, very badly overall. So specifically, blue-white has a a 61.5% win rate overall. If you're playing blue-white, you're going to win 65.5% of the time as a baseline. If you're playing blue-white, but you drafted Depopulate, uh, historically on this data set, those players only won 55.2% of the time, meaning they win over 6% less than if they just didn't have that card. What that tells me, and remember, they win more when they draw it than when they don't. So it's not that they draw the card and it causes them to lose. It's It has to be, because that's one pick can't make your deck that much worse. If, if you took nothing, your deck wouldn't be that bad. What it tells me is that people, when they draft Depopulate, draft completely differently. They, they try to draft it, presumably... They try to draft a control deck in, to maximize their like sweeper. Either that or they obsessively take anything with shield. Regardless, somehow they completely train wreck their drafts. So what I would say about Depopulate is maybe take it, but then just don't look at it. Pretend you don't have it, draft normally, and then put it in your deck. So that that I thought was just a really, a really interesting little quirk in the data. Other cards that are, you know, actually overrated rather than just tricking people. Unlicensed Hearse. This is a weird rare that has a very high ceiling. I have played again, played games where it's played on turn two. Both players put a lot of cards in their graveyard. It gets huge very quickly and kind of takes over the game. But I've also played a lot of games in this format because there's not a lot of blocking uh, where things don't really go to the graveyard. It's very bad to draw it late. This is a card that has a wide range of possible um, levels of impact on a game. And when that happens, it's very easy for people to have seen it be really good sometimes and then get the idea that it's very good and kind of ignore or not know about or not think much about the games where it isn't good and not know, well, I know that it can be good or bad. I don't know how often it's one of those or the other because you don't have a huge sample size personally. Data suggests pretty clearly the card's not great overall. Wiretapping, Scheming Fence, these are just like rares that people take very highly that in Wiretapping's case, it's like pretty bad, Scheming Fence, very mediocre. More relevantly, commons and uncommons that are overdrafted. Metropolis Angel, this is the two blue-white, three-one flying angel that draws a card when uh, whenever you attack with a creature, with one or more creatures that have a counter on them, you draw a card. This card is fine. It like uh, 58.1% game and hand win rate is like it's it's not bad to have to play that card, but it should be um, like it. That's kind of like the the bottom of what you want to be playing. This is a card that you shouldn't feel bad about cutting from your deck, or it, it like it's low level playable. This is another one like the hearse where there are some games where it's really going to shine. There are other games where being a 3-1 for 4 is too slow. There are games where you don't have a counter, and so that's all it is. There are games where your opponent has Night Clubber, and you get really destroyed. And uh, yeah, overall, you'd rather have a cheaper card. Rumor Gatherer, far worse. Uh, 54.8% game and hand win rate. This is the white, white, 1-2-1 one, one with Alliance... Scry one if it's the second time a creature entered the battlefield, draw a card. This card is good in some uh, decks that can routinely... Basically, this deck, this card is good if you can routinely trigger the draw ability, but it's quite bad if all it's doing is scrying sometimes. And blue-white is very bad at triggering the draw ability, so it's also pretty hard to cast, and... Even if you are triggering the draw ability, I don't think it's that great. A three mana two one is very bad at engaging in combat. You should be focusing on engaging in combat in this archetype and in this format. I would say you should essentially always ignore rumor gather in your blue white decks. Next up, hold for ransom, kill shot, angelic overseer, a little chat, obscura initiates are some commons that were overdrafted. Hold for Ransom and Kill Shot, Mediocre Removal Spells, those are basically... Mediocre Removal Spells as a class are kind of always uh, overrated. Sorry, Angelic Observer, yes. 
Angelic Observer is the, so Hold for Ransom is the like pacifism that your opponent can spend seven mana and give you a card to get out of. Uh, kill Shot is the three mana kill an attacker. Uh, Hold for Ransom is a card that I have yet to play. I'm kind of hoping to not play it. It has generally not been impressive against me. I can believe that Blue White is sometimes supposed to play it. You're generally trying to be aggressive. Two mana to answer like a creature is good if your opponent doesn't have a casualty card and if they can't get to seven. Like it, it's it's not that what it's doing is awful. It's that what it's doing is awful in enough por- in a large enough portion of games and the ceiling isn't there to justify that floor for me. Like the best case scenario is this is a fine card. The worst case scenario is this card's actively bad and that's not a trade-off I'm interested in. Uh, kill shot, you should be trying to be aggressive. You shouldn't be uh, a card that only answers, uh, that only does something when you're being attacked. Also, I've joked regularly that Metamorphosis, uh, Majestic Metamorphosis, the, you know, turn a creature into a 4 4 flyer draw card, is just kill shot draw a card because there are very few creatures in this format that are bigger than 4 4. Especially since you get flying, it's generally, you can generally kill an attacker by using Majestic Metamorphosis, and it has way, 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 way more play to it outside of that. So don't play Kill Shot. Try to find Metamorphosis instead. You can do that pretty easily. That card's very underdrafted. Angelic Observer is five and a white, three, three flyer, costs one less per citizen you have. This card has the lowest game in hand win rate of any card in blue-white that has enough, that's been played enough to have stats. That's bad. (laughs) <laughs> you should you should try not to play the worst card that people play. Too hard to have enough citizens in blue white to give this thing a good discount. Six mana for a three through flyer, five mana three for a three through flyer. Oh, those are both bad deals. A little chat. Sadly, as I said, doesn't have a great win rate. I love the card. It is what it is. Obviously, you know, sacking your creature to draw some cards is not what you should generally be trying to do in a tempo deck. So not not terribly surprised as much as I think it's an awesome card. And then Obscura Initiate, it's a Windrake. You shouldn't expect it to be good. It's a Windrake in a format where there's also a Windrake that draws a card at common and they just straight trade. You can spend some mana to get lifelink. You don't want to have to spend mana on your Windrakes after you've played them. I have almost played this card once, but I haven't played it yet. I might play it at some point, but you should generally try not to. So I mentioned that was looking at cards that are overdrafted. Now looking at cards that are overplayed. So these are cards that are played a lot relative to how much they win. Broker's Veteran, that's the one in a blue, two one that makes a shield counter when it dies. Doesn't have horrible stats, but it's played a a bunch and has, you know, mediocre stats. Backstreet Bruiser, that's the three three that can only attack if you have counters on two things. Pretty hard to attack with this, and again, you don't really want cards that are purely defensive in this format in general, certainly not in this archetype. Obscure Initiate, just talked about, that's the flyer that can get lifelink. Kill Shot, I've already talked about. Quick Draw Dagger, this one I think warrants a little bit further discussion, because it has been brought to my attention somewhat regularly that there are other content creators who are very big fans of Quick Draw Dagger. I am not, like, the the card doesn't read particularly strong to me. I have played it a little and generally been unimpressed. I've played against it a decent amount. It's had a range of possible outcomes that average out to not particularly impressive. And to the extent that it has decks that it does go in, I, I would say that that is true. There are decks that are not unhappy to play Quick Draw Dagger. I don't think that it's like make or break for those decks most of the time, but I think that there are decks that it's solid in. I don't think that Blue White is one of them because I think that uh, Quick Draw Dagger is a trick that gives you First Strike. First Strike is good when you are in combat with a creature, not when you are in combat with a player. That means that Quick Draw Dagger structurally is a card that is good when your creatures are getting into combat with other creatures, that is to say, either when you're blocking or when your opponent is blocking you. As a three mana trick, it's kind of fundamentally bad when you're blocking because needing to leave that much mana up for a defensive trick is 
bad because if your opponent plays around it, you just end up wasting the mana. So that means that it's good when you are attacking and getting blocked. Blue-white is really based on not getting blocked. Therefore, you should not want the dagger in your blue-white decks. If your goal is to give plus one, plus one to something like a fish or a skycrier, you can do that far more efficiently with Rafine's, whatever it's called, the plus one, plus one aura that you can cast from your graveyard. You don't care about Flash and First Strike if you're putting it on a fish. Uh, you do care about the ability to cast it for one mana or connive it away and cast it from your graveyard. And then if they like answer it to cast it again, all that stuff matters. You should play that card and not Quick Draw Dagger if you're putting it on an evasive creature. Leave Quick Draw Dagger to the decks where you have creatures that your opponent will block regularly and you're not blitzing them. Witness Protection, Buy Your Silence, these are just horrible removal spells that people sometimes play. I recommend not playing horrible removal spells. Uh, celebrity Fencer, uh, just a little, little slow to get going, a little expensive. Once it gets going, it's not that hard to jump block or kill. That's the three and a white 3-2 two, two that gets a plus one, plus one counter when a creature enters the battlefield under your control. Rumor Gatherer, I already talked about. Underplayed cards, looking at cards that people don't play all that much that have disproportionately good win rates uh, led to exactly one result, and that is Make Disappear. The one in a blue mana, well, uh, spend two more, it's countered that you can casualty, that has casualty one. This is a format that has both Make Disappear and Disdainful Stroke. Both of those are good at countering expensive spells because if your opponent is spending four or more mana for a spell, likely that means that they don't have two mana up in the very late game. In the very late game, they might, but also in the very late game, you might have a creature that you can afford to sacrifice to stop that important spell. So then they would need four or more mana up. There are times when, miss, when Make Disappear eventually goes dead, but the ability to counter things on turn two or counter cheaper spells whenever is a big deal, such that I think Make Disappear is directly better than Disdainful Stroke, not like strictly better, they do different things, but the way in which Make Disappear is better is such that I think that you should essentially always play any Make Disappear over any Disdainful Stroke. I could imagine a situation where that weren't true if you were specifically like planning to play really long games and had ways to like recur the spell from your graveyard regularly or something, but the way that games play in this format, I think that there are uh, essentially no decks that would prefer Disdainful Stroke to make Disappear. And also, countering is like, countering spells does matter in this format. There, there are good spells, there are busted rares. Uh, two is not a lot of mana. The deck, like, blue-white generally has a low enough curve that uh, it's not that hard to leave the mana up. There are other playable instants. The card plays well, you often want to play it. It has, I'm not sure about currently, but it has had like the best stats of any blue common, which is pretty impressive. That covers my overall stuff and my card by card analysis, which means that I've said what I have to say barring questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Twitch chat. If you have any questions about anything I said or anything else that relates to this archetype, enter those in the chat on Twitch now, regardless of whether you've already said something about them. While I'm giving people a chance to load, queue up some of those questions, want to direct everyone to patreon.com slash drafting archetypes. If you have any interest in supporting the program or uh, getting additional insights or access to my notes, my draft logs, uh, discounted coaching, any of that, please check out that website and consider uh, supporting the podcast. Also, as always, I want to thank my newest patrons of the week. So thank you very much for the support to Two Sandals, Brett and Philip. Now let's get to some questions from chat. A couple other things may be affecting the two color versus three color archetype stat difference. First, if you exclude green, white, blue, white, and green, blue, white, the gap between two and three color drops to 2% to 1%. Secondly, there are a lot more three color decks played than two color decks. The second point seems to go along with what I said about open lanes. Anything to draw from the first part, we default to avoiding black and red. So, the reason to default to avoiding black and red for the moment is Bant 
and blue white win way 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 more and so it's pretty safe to like start from white or start from blue and kind of expand out from there uh, based on what seems to be open that should likely eventually change. As for the point about the gap between um, in the win rates between two and three color decks decreasing um, when you look at decks outside of Bant, a uh, very interesting catch. That's a cool note. It makes some amount of sense to me that the Bant archetypes are the most aggressive and the more aggressive you are, the more important it is to have untapped consistent mana, the less you want to support three colors. Also, those colors don't have access to treasures, whereas like red and green do have access to treasures. Treasures, of course, make splashing and supporting three color mana bases easier. Definitely some interesting food for thought there. It doesn't change anything about like the blue-white analysis, but something to think about in the format in general and with those other decks. Uh, what are my thoughts on high toughness ground blockers like Broker's Initiates, Suspicious Bookcase, or Psionic Snoop in the Flyers game plan? Should I consider Kill Shot instead? Should I try to grab a couple in late picks wheels? They might be part of an evasion plan, but they don't seem to have a high win rate. Yeah, so I don't like Suspicious Bookcase. You're spending too much mana for what you're getting and you don't care about the ability if your creatures already have evasion. So we can write that one off. Broker's Initiate is pretty good if you're playing against especially like a Blitz deck where it can block a lot of those like cheaper Blitz creatures to stop them from getting incidental damage in. And it's also pretty good if you are, uh, if you have good ways to power it up. Like if you can enchant or equip it so it has some base power, it's very hard for your opponent to get off the board because it has so much toughness. And then in the late game, it threatens to be like truly enormous. I think it's fine to play small numbers of brokers and initiates in general. And then Psionic Snoop, I think, is good exactly with Expendable Lackey and Exotic Pets. Expendable Lackey because you want a way to discard it to make the fish without needing to cast the 1-1. One, one. And then you're up a card from the Knive and exotic pets because it's a way to get a plus one plus one counter to make your fish bigger and then you get a reasonable blocker to you know stop you from taking damage while your fish kill your opponent i think that if you don't have like multiple of exactly those cards or significant other connive synergies you should generally avoid a sonic snoop i do think that those cards are better than kill shot i think kill shot should be avoided pretty strongly as far as should you try to grab them um, as late picks around the wheel, you shouldn't try to. You should take like the generically good cards over them. But if you end up with those and fail to get enough, just like general proactive cards, it's not bad to fill out your deck with them. What rares or uncommons are worth leaving the blue light path or splashing? It's either Bant or Esper. So the question about like leaving the path depends on how committed to the path you are. Like uh, I can't say, well, this is the list of rares that you should abandon because you know the the pack one pick one situation is very different than the pack two situation is very different than the pack three situation, and the pack two and three situation depend on how much fixing you have, how good your deck is, how open the lanes all of the lanes in question have been so far in the draft like have you been kind of cut or is your color really flowing has the color of that rare been kind of cut or is it really flowing and as far as like pack one pick one so part of the issue here is this is to some extent a metagame question and i expect the metagame to be fluctuating pretty quickly such that the answer might be different today while i'm recording this versus this weekend when the podcast goes live if I were to say like rares exactly at this level or better, for example, what I would say is the best way to think about it is probably if I'm in blue white and I believe that I can be in blue white, you know, I can keep that 61.5% win rate on average in mind and say, all right, the baseline for like a normal blue white deck, 61.5%. Now with the rare that I'm thinking about taking, I can look at that rare's game played win rate, so the record of decks that can include that rare. And if it's above 61.5%, 
then there's some kind of baseline advantage to be gained. And if it's below 61.5%, then there's kind of a baseline disadvantage to playing that instead of the alternative of playing blue-white as a baseline, if you believe that you can reliably get into blue-white. Now, the other question, of course, is, well, what card are you taking it over? Because the, the actual opportunity cost of that pick matters a lot. If you're taking it over a replacement level card in blue-white, say a card that in blue-white wins 58% of the time, uh, you're not really giving anything up. You might as well have take the high upside card. You know, if that card doesn't reach the like, you know, 61.5% game played win rate, but it, it, at least, you know, performs well in an archetype that might end up being what's open, then you should take that over taking something that is not going to meaningfully help your other alternative. This is to say drafting is complicated, but you can use stats to help you out. And I hope I've illustrated some of how to use those stats to try to answer that question. What has been the most difficult counter ar archetype so far to blue white? That is a good question. And I think that the answer is more specific cards and less specific archetypes. And I think that this best specific card is probably Night Clubber, as far as from among commons and uncommons. And uh, sweepers in general help a lot. Uh, I, th I think that, you know, the answer to the best counter archetype might be like, Maestros, if and only if it has or draws some kind of sweeper effect, including Night Clubber. That is my best guess answer to that question. How much value does Suspicious Bookcase have in this set? When in general does a card like Suspicious Bookcase warrant inclusion in your deck? I think Suspicious Bookcase is not good. I think that it doesn't block well enough and your other creatures don't need help attacking enough as a baseline for it to be a card that you generally want in any deck. The spot where you would want it is if it's somehow necessary to break an expected board stall, but that's just not what this format's about. You could side it in if you're playing best of three against decks that have a lot of blitz creatures with less than three or less than four power. But while the format is largely evolving around evasive creatures because blue white is kind of the like go-to deck, a uh, suspicious bookcase really has no place. What are the implications of a stacked three drop slot uh, in this type of deck or in the format as a whole as it happens? The implications are that you should disproportionately prioritize cards with other casting costs, especially cards that cost two. I think that it's very reasonable to take premium two mana spells over premium three mana spells. Like Fairy Vandal is not as good as Inspiring Overseer or Exotic Pets, but I think that it's reasonable to like pack one, pick one, take a fairy vandal over inspiring overseer or exotic pets, for example. You don't want to go too far with that, but it is really, really nice if you can have a good curve with good ones and twos rather than just a giant pile of good threes. Another implication of the stacked three drop is that it makes a uh, gathering throng a lot less impressive because gathering throng. Uh, puts a lot of when you have when it when it's working as intended that is to say when you have a lot of them it puts a lot of extra three drops in your deck which puts a lot of pressure on just like the other threes so this leads well into the next question which is what are the best uh picks to start gathering the gathering throngs so there are decks that have there are white decks that have no interest in gathering throngs where even if you could just add five gathering throngs to your deck at the end of the draft you wouldn't want to play any of them because you were in a seat where you happened to get a bunch of premium three drops and you just don't have enough room to put the throng in your deck. There are other decks that you know focus on having good twos, maybe some fours, some ones, maybe a lot of connives so you can play Gathering Throng once and then discard the rest for value or whatever. They do want Gathering Throng, but I think that you should not start a draft trying to collect Gathering Throngs because you might fail and you might succeed but not want them. And so you shouldn't be spending picks on cards that you would definitely want for cards that you may or may not want, depending on whether you can get more of them and how the draft goes. I think the second half of pack one 
is a good time to start taking Gathering Throng if it's there at not a very high opportunity cost. If like pick six through nine of the draft is the best time to take your first Gathering Throng, that still doesn't mean that you should take Gathering Throng over a card that wins a lot more than Gathering Throng, but it means that you you know can consider taking Gathering Throng rather than completely ignoring it the way that you should in like pack three. So I would say in general, err away from trying to collect Gathering Throngs, but the time to make the decision is generally the back half of pack one. If you see it in the back half of pack one, it means that no one else at the table is very aggressively trying to snap them up, and there's still a lot of time for more of them to be opened. And I need both of those things to be true for me to consider it personally. More general question, at what pick do you typically start looking to shore up your mana base during the draft? Pick one, pack one. I think that you should always be thinking about uh, your mana. I think that, you know, if you start with a three color card, you want to make sure that you're going to have fixing starting with the second pick. If you have like a weak pack with a strong land, for example, if you have the uh, Bant three color Trium, like the, the rare land, I think that that's a very reasonable first pick given how successful Bant is saying, okay, cool, my Bant man is going to be pretty good, is a fine way to start a draft. I've made that pick pretty recently. But really, I, I think to give a more precise answer, as soon as you have a good reason to believe that you're going to be playing more than two colors, you should start prioritizing the lands and the gold common cycle that improves your lands. Uh, you should start, you know, prioritizing them very highly. You should start taking them anytime you're not passing like an absolute premium card to make sure that you can cast your spell as well. How are you envisioning the boundaries between archetypes in this format? I've had decks that followed this general game plan, but splash green for shovel, the gorilla, etc. Am I playing a blue white deck or a broker's deck? You could be doing either. It really just depends on mentally how you choose to categorize those things and what value you get out of that question. To the extent that you think of a blue white deck as an evasive tempo deck, and you think of a you know broker's deck as something else, maybe you think of a broker's deck as a counter's deck, maybe you think of a broker's deck as a double strike combo deck, maybe you think of a broker's deck as like uh, green white aggressive creatures backed by blue tempo spells, Wh whatever it is that you think of a broker's deck as. Um, or maybe you just mean any deck that has, you know, balanced three color mana or something. I, I guess I would ask what value are you getting out of this label rather before telling you which label to apply. And I think that's my full answer to the question. Uh, like you, you know, you know, the deck in question. And so when you're asking, how should I label the deck? The answer is what value do you get out of this label? Next up, how worthwhile are the non-metamorphosis combat tricks like Revelation of Power or Boon of Safety? Would you run them in place of Make Disappear? I think Make Disappear is generally better than Revelation of Power or Boon of Safety, as far as would, but I don't know exactly what you mean by in place of. If you mean if you can't find Make It Disappear, would you be more likely to play these? I would be more likely to play them insofar as I am less likely to pay to play tricks if I don't have enough creatures. The more instance and interactive cards like Make Disappear I have, the fewer creatures I have, the worse combat tricks are going to be. If my deck is all creatures, I am more likely to need combat tricks. Revelation of Power might fit the bill there. Boon of Safety is a card that I personally haven't found a compelling reason to play. Revelation of Power I have played in conjunction with Illuminator Virtuoso specifically, though uh, the Double Strike Duelist would also be a good reason. I think you largely want either roughly all of your creatures to uh, have plus one, plus one counters a reasonable portion of the time, or a couple of Double Strike creatures to uh, really be interested in Revelation of Power. And I think that you should very rarely, if ever, be interested in Boon of Safety. With Blitz existing, do you feel it's always uh do you feel it's better to always leave a creature open to block? No, because you don't always want to block a blitz creature. In fact, you usually don't want to block a blitz creature. Like if you have like a three-one or something and your opponent has a blitz creature, 
and you block, you've lost your creature and they still draw their card. You should try to be in a position where you acknowledge that, like when your opponent plays a blitz creature, they're playing a burn spell that draws a card. A burn spell that draws a card is generally going to lose a ra- lose the race to a creature that stays in play and attacks them again. They're not committing material to the board. They're just doing something short term. You should take advantage of that in your blue-white decks and punish them by committing to the board to get ahead so that they can't afford to blitz you. So by holding, if you're holding your creatures back early, you're... N- leaving them in a position where they can afford to uh, play the, your, their Blitz creatures. And if you're blocking, you're really playing into their game plan and giving them card advantage. You should keep Blitz in mind, but the way to do that is not by attempting to block. If you do, if you are trying to block a Blitz creature, you know, you should draft uh, like Broker's Initiates and stuff like that that you naturally want to leave back and can block Blitz creatures profitably. But uh, for the most part, that that shouldn't be your go-to way of thinking about how to deal with Blitz creatures. Next up, how much do you emphasize the counters thing? Are there cards that go up significantly once you have pets or regulators? How much does a lot of connive affect your picks build? Exotic pets specifically is the card that most changes my prioritization of plus one, plus one counters. If I have exotic pets, I try very hard to find specifically Rafine's Informants and Backup Agents, particularly since I think both of those cards are good anyway. But I will sometimes play, for example, Psionic Snoop to get the plus one plus one counter if I have specifically exotic pets, especially multiple exotic pets. I don't think that uh, there are very many other cards that like care about plus one plus one counters in a way that is sufficient to make me care about them, um, rather than it just being an incidental thing. Relatedly, do you value shield counters to turn on your counters matters stuff? I mostly don't. I, I would consider it a trivial advantage for exotic pets and mostly just evaluate the shield counter stuff on its own rather than as part of like other counter synergies. This is largely because I think that, you know, Metropolis Angel, for example, which is another one of the big draws to uh, the Counter Synergy or Backstreet Bruiser, both of those cards are like somewhat overrated and not something I'm particularly inclined to go out of my way to like get the best version of when I could just not play them instead. If you had a solid version of the aggressive blue-white deck, Will you consider splashing the 4-4 common creature that also uh, fixes for two mana as a top end for the deck? Yes, I would consider it. I, I think that you can be straight blue-white and consider playing the Adjudicator. It shouldn't be a priority, but it's a fine play. Why not discuss Bant instead of blue-white? This is probably an off-topic question, but I'm discussing blue-white instead because I think that it's better. I've played it more and... Uh, I think that it made sense to start with the best performing deck. I, I, I will get to Bant. While going for any deck, if I had the choice between a dual color horizon land and the tri-color fetch land, uh, which one would have a higher priority if you're going uh, down a two color deck lane with nothing to splash? So if you're playing a two color deck, you should definitely prioritize the land that taps for both your colors and you can sacrifice over the land that gains a life. The the ability to sacrifice your land to draw a card and also the fact that you can tap it for different colors of mana across different turns is certainly more valuable than gaining a life in whatever you, you, like to the extent that you're thinking about the thinning effect, that effect is extremely minor in terms of like the average number of lands you draw in a game or whatever. Uh, you should basically discount it. So you're basically looking at gain one life versus the ability to sack and draw and fixing your mana slightly more. You should prioritize the, uh, the the tap land over the sack land in two color decks. In three color decks, getting the extra color is far more valuable, and you should prioritize the fully on color set, uh, fetch land over the sack land, but the uh, sack lands over the partially on color uh, fetch lands. Early in the draft, it's different. If you don't know, you should probably prioritize the three color fetch lands over the two color lands to give you optionality to splash another color. Next up, isn't first pick first pack about picking the best cards and forcing blue white not the right way? 
Well, it all depends on what you mean by forcing and what you mean by picking the best cards. So like, I think that a good way to evaluate good first picks is to look at the game played win rate of each of the cards available to you on 17 lands as a way to see how often would a deck with this card, or what is the average win rate I should expect a deck with this card to end up having? When you do that, a vast majority of packs will have a card that goes in blue, white, or bant as the card that has the highest game played win rate because those decks win so much more than other decks. And then that would be a reasonable card to take out of that pack in terms of taking the card that gives you the highest expected win rate from known information at that point in the draft. Your call, whether you believe that that is in some way forcing or not, but uh, the idea there is to take into account both the power level of the card itself as well as the power level of uh, the cards that you would expect to play around it. Uh, how much should playing around Nightclubber be on our minds when playing blue white against black decks? Uh, I mostly learn, lean toward hope they don't have it, but uh, if you can afford to play around it, then you should, I guess. It's a tough one to like, you, you don't want to put yourself in a spot where like you lose to other cards because you played around that, especially since often like that's still better than the other cards they would have. So you like lose to both it and other cards if you play around it, where like you only lose to it if you don't play around it. Like your deck is probably structured against a black deck such that you kind of need to just get them dead. And so like early, there's not a lot of opportunity to play around Night Clubber. And late, it's largely too late and they would have already used it. So I think for the most part, playing around it doesn't come up all that often. What common and uncommons in black red and at what pick would be a flag for you? Um, enough that you would think this could be open and this specific card is good enough to risk going that direction. Again, it's all about opportunity cost. If I'm already in blue white or you know think that I likely can be, then, you know, like I'm not going to take murder over Rafine's informant. If there's not a card that I care about in my deck and there's a murder, then maybe I'll take the murder. The answer is that while I'm expecting to be blue-white, I'm looking to pivot rather than jump, which means that I'm extremely unlikely to take any red card. And murder has a significant drawback of costing double black, but a card like... Rufian Silencer or Night Clubber that I could potentially splash um, in, you know, what would end up being an Esper deck uh, is a much lower investment and a much more likely pick to pay dividends. And so I would take it more highly. But it's always a question of, you know, opportunity cost versus potential reward. And so it's always less about like, this is the common where I'm going to like take this and more about should I take this card or that card? What are the reasons for each of them? Have I had a successful blue white deck without pets? Yes. I found regulators to be so huge in blue white decks. Can you build around those or what might a blue white deck without pets look like? Just the other good cards. <laughs> it, it, it looks basically the same. I think that you know, regulator is a good way to make sure that you're like getting through by shutting down blockers, but you can kind of get the same effect out of uh, Majestic Metamorphosis and Rooftop Nuisance. All right. The next question is, can you talk specifically about Public Enemy? So I have not had occasion to play Public Enemy yet. I think the card is very interesting. It has really bad stats, which is not very surprising to me. It has a pretty impressive ceiling. If you play it on a creature and your opponent can't answer the creature that you play it on, then they have to attack you with everything. And then if you have bigger creatures than they do, you can eat all of their creatures. Blue-white is not good at any part of this. Blue-white is not about having big creatures to block your opponent's attackers and kill them. And the card is fundamentally really poorly positioned in the format where there are 
so many uh, creatures that are good at attacking, bad at blocking, a good amount of removal, uh, tapping tricks, evasive creatures. So it's a very like cool card, very unusual effect, very high ceiling of impact. But despite all of that, this is not the right format for it. It just doesn't line up well with what's going on most of the time. It would be interesting to see this card in like a totally different format or potentially play it in certain like chaos draft decks or something. But given it's really bad stats and just what I now know about how the format plays out, I think it is best avoided. Pack one, pick one, pickpocket or fish. Pickpocket has better stats in a single color. I would take fish. I think that it might be objectively wrong to take fish, but I've been super impressed by them, and so that's what I would do. On average, would you say shields are better offensively or defensively? No, I wouldn't. It's possible that they are better offensively or defensively, but it's a tricky and weird question. I still kind of largely think that shields... Like, people have asked about, like, what portion of a card is a shield or whatever... I still think shields are most analogous to like having some toughness and I I wouldn't say, you know, is toughness better on offense or defense? I guess defense maybe, but it's not super clear and depends on the card. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. Thank you very much everyone for tuning in and thanks for all the questions. And I expect that I will probably manage to be back next week. I am, I typically record from my apartment in California. I'm going to be visiting Madison next week. And I I no longer have uh, my old setup in Madison. I will attempt to have an infrastructure to be able to stream some and record there. I don't know for sure how successful that'll be, but I, I, I most likely We'll be back next week, and thanks again, and have a good week, and draft some blue-white. I strongly recommend it. All right, bye for now, everyone.